My project began with self-reflection. I wanted to know how I could give back to my community. Before I could answer that question, I had to define my home. Beyond the immediate vicinity of concrete walls and glass panes was a vibrant neighborhood. I wouldn't feel the same sense of home without the people and environment around me. Spending an afternoon trekking the rugged Ko'ola ridges or an evening enjoying the sunset over Mount Alul Bay always gives me peace and a unique sense of belonging. It's hard for me to imagine life separate from this paradise. This is what molded my essential question into the issue of environmental stewardship. For as long as I can remember, I was learning about this island's climate and ecology. This project gave me the opportunity to translate that learning into action. My goal was to support the sustainability of the land so that future generations within the community can benefit from the rewards. My action plan was centered around habitat restoration and Keavava wetland. The acre of land is split into two sections, one owned by Kamehameha Schools and the other by the nonprofit Livable Hawaii Kai. Their parcel was purchased from the nearby developers with the assistance of the Trust for Public Lands. They are the stewards of the entire property. Before development within the Mauna Loa watershed, the area had extensive estuarine and freshwater wetlands. The freshwater wetlands, along with the rice ponds and kala patches, supported many alai ulo. Improving the conditions of this environment bolsters the recovery chance for the endemic and endangered bird. Additionally, the local subset greatly contributes to biodiversity. They have alleles unique from the rest of the population. On July 21, 2017, the American Bird Conservatory estimated there were only 300 left. They projected their numbers would either remain stable or grow, but the levels were dangerously low. In response, I focused on removing invasive species. I had several targeted areas which resulted in multiple positive outcomes. I cleared the bulrush by the embankment, trimmed an overhanging tree, removed an Indian fleabane bush, cleared debris from the water, and cut grass. The impact of these efforts will hopefully have a long-term effect on the survival of the species. Although my selected plot was small, the changes were noticeable. In order to quantify my effort, I recorded the biomass of removed plant matter. Native birds, including the Alai Ula, are under threat from predators such as mongoose, cats, and rats. A study done on invasive species in Hawaii, biology and impacts of Pacific Island invasive species, suggested the best method for managing mongoose populations was preventing further spread. Since complete eradication is unfeasible, Livable Hawaii Kai utilizes several preventative measures. Predator fences and traps are effective, but they are not viable approaches for me. Instead, I was tasked with creating a buffer between the land and inner nesting grounds. The separation keeps predators at bay. This involved the removal of the California bulrush adjacent to the embankment and an overhanging tree. Thinning out the reeds served another purpose too. A conservation plan for the wetlands written by Charles Van Rees suggested removing 20-40% to 40 of the bulrush cover along with a 2 meter buffer. This would create a better nesting ground for the birds. In the end, I was only able to create a pathway at most a meter wide and a few meters long. Despite the relatively small difference, the usable environment for the Alai Ula was expanded. The second component of invasive species removal contributed towards food availability. Removal is a precursor to the introduction of native plants, reducing competition for resources. I removed thick grass and Indian fleabane. Grass removal gave room for an alpaca plant to spread in the future and cleared up room to plant ai. Unfortunately, the grass cover is thick. Its density was surprising, illustrating the importance of upkeep. The same benefits were derived from removing the bush, but it proved to be a greater task. First, the bush had to be reduced to a stump. This involved clearing dozens of leafy branches. Once the stump was reached, I enlisted the help of a fellow volunteer who used the mattock to dig up and cut its roots. Although the total invasive coverage was not extensively diminished, the work laid the ground for a native foothold. Native plants are a vital aspect of the habitat as they provide a food source for the Alaiula. Lastly, I removed excess plant debris from sawing and tennis balls from the water. The total biomass I removed excluding the bulky overhanging tree branches, was 100.7 pounds. A study published in the Annual Review of Ecology concluded that the comparative invasive growth rates were not higher in general, but rather depend on growth conditions. In particular, they are able to outcompete natives in suboptimal conditions, often a result of human development. Therefore, it's imperative to preserve and improve the existing habitat. 
Assuming growth conditions are acceptable and the RI and alpaca fit the native mold from the study, the plants and birds are poised to take advantage of the removal. The future of the wetlands primarily rests in the actions of the community, but outside organizations and the government can still make an impact. Livable Hawaii Kai represents the concerns of many residents. The partially restored state of the wetlands is only possible through regular volunteer involvement. Members contribute through ecological recommendations, scientific research, group work, organization, and leadership. Potential improvements are both infrastructural and environmental, and both contribute to the overall health of the wetlands. However, much of the current effort is still focused on the Makaya land track. The entrenchment and expanse of invasive species requires an extensive amount of ongoing effort. So far, the work has produced great results and it would not make sense to divert labor. However, I can continue to work on my original area. Once the rest of the invasives are cleared, I can shift the watering and weeding. Gathering metrics is also crucial to the long-term health of the wetlands. Charles Van Rees, the ecological advisor for Liverpool Hoikai, recommended periodic monitoring of salinity, turbidity, and water depth. The work done here comprises the majority of the conservation process, but there are other roles as well. State and federal government impact conservation. The federal precedent for preservation and protection was set by the Clean Water and Endangered Species Acts. Resources can also be directly applied to conservation initiatives. 38% of the state DLNR budget, equating to 63.6 .6 million, is devoted towards environmental protection. Finally, public money can fund research to conduct studies and openly post their results. These are all applicable to the local wetlands. Regulation could discourage damaging runoff, grant money can assist local organizations, and UH-backed studies can supplement independent research. Embarking on my project gave me a greater respect for the land and the work it takes to maintain it. Initially, I was overly optimistic. After some helpful consultation with Elizabeth Riley and Dylan Ramos, I was confident I could check off every preservation goal. However, the work on paper was not reflective of the effort in the field. Manually removing sets of grass, shrubs, and tree branches took more time and energy than I expected. In the end, I wasn't able to completely reform even a small area. At the same time, it was rewarding to see the bigger picture. There was a little cove on the opposite side of the property. The pond within the marsh was surrounded by a crescent of eye eye on one side and a forest of bulrush on the other. It wasn't much, there were only a few square meters of open water, but it was enough for the Elite Ula. With a little more time and dedication, my plot could yield the same results. <laughs>